All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first, I want to thank everybody for coming this morning. I'd like to thank Dr. Adams for uh, hosting us, uh, for giving me a job and helping thoracic surgery get off the ground here at Mount Sinai. Uh, second, I'd like to thank Dr. Uh, James Kirshner for coming today, Paul Kirshner's son. Paul Kirshner, as many of you know, was the head of thoracic surgery over here at Mount Sinai for many years. Uh, he had a uh, bunch of significant contributions to our field and to the community of Mount Sinai. He recently passed away a couple years ago, um, and, uh, and this lectureship is in his name. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Frank Detterbeck for coming today. Uh, as many of you know, uh, Frank Detterbeck is the head of thoracic surgery over at Yale. Um, he is someone who I met over 20 years ago when I was a fellow. Uh, I remembered him at a conference because uh, this was a CLGB conference back, I think, in 97. And I had read one of his papers on Pankos tumors, and it stuck in my head how clear his writing was and how insightful this paper was. And when I met him, it was like meeting one of the gods of thoracic surgery. I was like, wow, you're Frank Detterbeck. And it really, he really left an impression on me when I met him then, not necessarily that here's this person that wrote this thing that gave me such knowledge, but his humility when you met him. He was like very matter of fact about it, like, oh yeah, I'm glad you liked it. And that's probably one I, one I think of, of his best qualities. Um, even though here at Mount Sinai, uh, we're not Yale, but Frank is in good company with our past Kirshner lectures uh, with the likes of Doug Matheson and Joel Cooper, David Sugarbaker, Mark Oringer, Valerie Roosh. And um, we're just adding to that list now by having Frank Detterbeck talk to us about the approach to ground glass nodules. And it's a very timely topic given the fact that now CT screening has become standard of care. We're fortunate enough here at Mount Sinai to have the pioneers of CT screening, Claudia Henschke and David Yankelovitz. And this fits right into that whole new paradigm that we have in thoracic surgery. So, uh, Without further ado, Frank Detterbeck. Well, it's uh, it's my pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, I did not know Dr. Kirshner, but I certainly knew of him, and uh, I know a number of people in the room here, and certainly known Roger for a long time, and uh, appreciate the invitation. So I'll uh, give you kind of my thoughts about ground glass nodules, but I hope that we have some time for discussion because I would very much like to learn from people here about uh, how you think about it. I'm, uh, I continue to evolve in my thinking. I think that I'm evolving forward, but uh, I'm, you know, continue to be challenged by trying to figure out how we manage this. So, a couple of, uh, you know, things that have influenced my thinking. So uh, there's some evidence that not all ground glass nodules are the same, that there are some different developmental pathways, that there may be some that, uh, I'll see if I can get this mouse to work here, you know, there may be some that uh, uh, develop into AAH, but actually do not have the capacity to uh, progress and others that have the capacity to uh, progress into invasive adenocarcinomas and that, you know, they have some different genetic uh, mutations that are part of that. Uh, there probably are other pathways as well that lead to invasive adenocarcinoma, not just this pathway. And, and I think we see that clinically, or at least I think I see that clinically. I certainly see some cancers that seem to develop from ground glass nodules and others that seem to be solid, speculated things right from the beginning. So this is some of the data here. This is uh, looking at uh, uh, partially ground glass uh, nodules and uh, looking at different uh, histotypes and looking at the incidence of uh, KRAS differentiation, uh, and so, you know, KRAS is going down, 
um, EGFR is going up. So it would suggest that if, you know, KRAS is really a marker of, you know, development into an aggressive cancer, it shouldn't be going down as you go towards more aggressive cancers. Uh, so this is sort of striking and odd. Um, also, you know, the KRAS and EGFR are mutually exclusive, so that suggests that maybe there are different, you know, pathways. Uh, and then these moderately or poorly differentiated adenos kind of follow a little bit of a different pattern, suggesting maybe there's a, a different pathway for these altogether. So that's one piece of data. Here's the data from another study that looked at uh, nodules that grew versus nodules that did not grow, and clearly there's a difference in the uh, mutational patterns there. Uh, there's some evidence from mouse models that uh, uh, KRAS uh, mutated mice develop AAH, but that does not progress onto adenocarcinoma, and EGFR mutated mice develop AAH, which progresses on to uh, lipidic adenocarcinoma. So again, you know, different sort of different avenue of research, but seems to have the same uh, theme. Uh, there's another human study that uh, was looking at uh, nodules that are stable or nodules that are growing, and uh, here the EGFR is maybe not quite as uh, impressive, but the P53 is very, you know, very different. Uh, so I think all of this to me suggests that, you know, all GGOs may not be exactly the same, and maybe we need to think about them a little bit differently and try to figure out, you know, which is which. So I think that... You know, they're not all destined to grow. Uh, some of them perhaps don't. Um, I don't know that we know that for sure, but uh, I think so. So let's switch a little bit to some clinical data. So this is data from a, a study from uh, 2013 where they followed uh, GGO lesions for quite some time. So here up to 10 years. And you can see that there's a good number that did not change, and then there are some that did grow over time. Uh, so again, kind of suggesting maybe there are different populations here. Uh, so this is for all GGNs. They looked at just lesions less than a centimeter, looked at pure GGNs, but it's all the same pattern. So what is the natural history of GGNs? So this is all the data that I could put together from a number of studies that have uh, looked at that. Um, so you can do it just kind of by colors. You can say if it's becoming more solid, that's maybe a bad sign, so I put that in red. And if it's increasing in size, that's maybe also concerning, that's in orange. And you know, if it didn't change, it's uh, blue. So just kind of looking at this overall, you say, well, there's, there's not that much red here. There's some. It, it's kind of variable. Now, these are all kind of different studies, and they selected patients differently, and so you have to kind of take it with a grain of salt. But if you look at the pure GGOs here, there's not all that much red there. When you get into the mixed lesions, that's where there's more. So you can also look at, uh, in studies where there was a period of observation, uh, what was the final diagnosis? Uh, and so, again, for pure GGOs, the final diagnosis of invasive adenocarcinoma in red, there's not all that much of it. <coughs> now, this is back in a prior era when BAC still existed. That's, of course, been eradicated from the face of the earth. So um, there was some population of that. Um, and again, it's a little bit higher in these... Uh, mixed lesions. <clears throat> so this is another study that I found very interesting. This was just published uh, very recently. So this was a prospective long-term study. Uh, these were patients that were accrued between 2000 and 2005 and then followed for 10 to 15 years. So remarkable prospective study. Uh, pure or part solid GGOs less than three centimeters. They had a you know, clear definition of what they defined as growth. Um, and this is what they found. So they found that uh, over time, you know, most of these did not really change. So that's in white here. Uh, especially when you look at the pure GGOs, there are not too many that progressed. Uh, 
More often when you had a part solid component or consolidated component, uh, those were the ones that uh, eventually progressed more often. Uh, and these progressed sort of within three years. And in this study, they suggested that maybe you only needed to follow them for three years because if they didn't change in three years, they weren't going to. I'm a little less comfortable with that, and I'll show you a little bit more data on it. Um, and if you look up here, there's a relatively small percentage, but there are some patients that progressed after three years, and I'm not sure we really know down here. So overall, for natural history, I think that there's a certain number that disappear. They usually disappear pretty early. Uh, I think most of them don't really change. Maybe 20% get larger, maybe 5% develop a solid uh, portion. Uh, that's kind of what I gleaned from the literature. So if we say that maybe there are different populations and maybe some of these don't really progress and so forth, how do we select which patients we need to, to do something about? So one approach is to base it on histology. Um, I'll go through that first. So, you know, that comes from studies like this where you can see that those patients that had AIS did very, very well. Uh, those patients that had other forms of adenocarcinoma did less well. 100% uh, five-year survival here. So the argument there is that, you know, if we are resecting these when they are still AIS, MIA, we're going to do much better, and so histology is really what we should be using to, to guide us. And there are countless papers that have diagrams like this that show a CT image and show a, you know, microscopic uh, slide um, with pure GGO and AIS and, you know, small solid component and MIA and then invasive adenocarcinoma. And there's so many papers like this and they all suggest that it's a nice correlation. Pure GGO, it's going to be AIS. There are many people that find those terms to be interchangeable. I'm not so sure. When I look in the literature to say, well, how often is that true? This is what I get. So these are pure GGOs here. So these are papers that reported, you know, kind of what, what the uh, histology was. And it's kind of all over the map. So this is lipidic predominant adenocarcinoma in red, MIA in orange. Uh, now, you know, the studies are all a little bit different. So some of them excluded AA, AAH, some of them excluded invasive adenocarcinomas. And so it's kind of all over the map a little bit, but the bottom line is these are pure GGOs. You would have expected if you look at those papers showing this nice you know, correlation or suggesting this nice correlation that these should all be AIS or maybe AAH and AIS, and they're clearly not. You know, for the ones that are, you know, part solid, there's certainly more invasive cancer perhaps, but again, there's a fair amount of AIS in here and a fair amount of MIA. So I don't think that the, the radiographic appearance really correlates all that well with the histology. I think we have to be careful. So there's a good number of studies that have said, okay, fine, you know, we'll accept that. But let's look at other features. Let's not just look at, is this purely ground glass? Let's look at other things. So we can look at uh, size, we can look at uh, uh, the size of the solid component, component how dense it is, uh, mass calculation, margins, you know, various things, and it didn't even include everything. And, you know, some papers looked at the differentiation between adeno versus a combination of AIS, MIA. Others looked at MIA versus a combination of AIH and uh, AIS. Um, but the bottom line is when I look at this, I don't walk away with the sense that we've clearly defined what are the features that tell us, based on the radiographic imaging, what the histology is going to be. I'm just not very comfortable that I really can make that translation. Um, 
So <clears throat> there are you know, a good number of studies. I showed you one earlier that suggests that AIS does very well. And when you have invasive cancer, you don't do as well. This is another study, a different one. Uh, so these pre-invasive or minimally invasive do much better. And the uh, invasive don't do as well. So there are a lot of studies that show that. One of the problems with I have with these studies is that they are mixing things. So this was either GGN or solid tumors. Same thing here. They're all clinical stage one. Uh, and so it really confuses the issue. And the slide I showed you earlier, um, that also was everything from a pure GGO up to a pure solid speculated lesion and showing that you know histotype made a difference. But that's in a mixture of patients. I'm not sure that's really the question I'm asking. And this one study here is the only one that, that I know of that just looked at pure GGNs or ones that had a very small solid portion. And in this study, it didn't matter what the histotype was. It didn't matter whether it was AIS or MIA or invasive adeno, survival was excellent. So I think that when we look at these studies, we're mixing things up. We're mixing up the solid lesions and the GGO lesions. And then when we start to say, well, we're going to select patients based on histology, I think we're getting mixed up. And I think if we have a pure GGO lesion and we say the histology is what's important, I'm not so sure when I look at the study that it really is. So the way I see it, I think that, you know, the studies that show that the histotype makes a difference are looking at the whole gamut of things. If we look at pure GGOs, I'm not so sure that the histotype has an impact. And when I look at these other subtypes here from an imaging standpoint, uh, I'm not so sure what the, uh, what the impact actually is. So I have trouble with this. I think you don't know the histotype until you've resected it. In fact, you can't actually diagnose something as AIS or MIA unless the pathologist has a whole specimen. So histotype doesn't help me in my you know, decisions about how to manage. Um, correlation between imaging and histotype is imperfect. Uh, and I'm not sure that the histotype really predicts the behavior. I think that a pure GGO, you already know a lot about that behavior. Uh, and I'm not sure how much the histotype adds. So I don't tend to put much stock in this. So let me talk about some imaging features and I'm gonna just focus on one, one aspect. So the solid tumor size. So here's a completely solid tumor, size one and a half centimeters, solid tumor size one and a half centimeters. Here's a part solid tumor, Total size, maybe 2.8, solid size, only one centimeter. And here's a pure GGO, total size, maybe three centimeters, and solid size, of course, zero, because it's a pure GGO. And so we've tended to just look at the, the overall, traditionally, we've kind of looked at the overall size, but maybe that's not what we should look at. So here's a study that uh, looked at uh, 191 patients. And if you look here at the total tumor size, you say, okay, less than one centimeter did great. Well, wait a minute, down here. So three, 1.2, 2.3, I'm not seeing a pattern. And of course, the people said off the total tumor size was not at all predictive. On the other hand, when you looked at the invasive tumor size, this is now invasive based on the pathologic examination, there's a very nice uh, stepwise correlation here. The larger the invasive size, the worse the prognosis. And in fact, there are quite a number of studies. This is another one, 502 patients, clinical stage 1A, and they looked at the ability to predict a variety of things. So here, node involvement, so whole tumor size, not so good. Solid tumor size performed much better. Looking at other things, pathologic invasiveness, lymphatic invasion, vascular invasion, pleural invasion, all of it correlated more with solid tumor size. So there are a number of multivariate analyses that suggest that solid tumor size consistently predicts recurrence-free survival, um, and that the GGO component 
probably doesn't really add anything prognostically. So this is one more study that I think was particularly well done, 241 patients, pathologic stage 1A, adenocarcinoma, all of them resected, uh, full spectrum from GGO to solid, but they looked at what influence does this have, the proportion of solid to the proportion of GGO, and they did a number of different analyses. Uh, it was based on thin slice CT, and they looked at size in a lot of different ways. Uh, so it did a multivariate analysis, solid size was prognostic, um, but um, overall size was not prognostic. Uh, they looked at subgroups, so they said, all right, let's take all the ones that have a solid size between 1 and 10, 10 to 20, or greater than 20, and we'll look at uh, you know, how much additional GGO component was there, and they couldn't show any difference there. They propensity matched <laughs> patients. Um, and when they propensity matched them for the same solid tumor size, they couldn't find that the addition of a ground glass component made any difference or the amount of addition of ground glass component, and then the same sort of rock analysis. So pretty well done study. They really looked at it in a lot of different ways, uh, and they couldn't find that there was a, uh, a difference from overall size and that it was solid tumor size. So the next edition of the stage classification system has actually uh, taken that to, uh, to be the definition of how we should be assigning size. So we should be recording the overall size, so the lipidic component or the ground glass component, and we should be recording the invasive component or the solid tumor size based on CT. But the thing that defines the T is the solid tumor size in the eighth edition of the stage classification system. Now, I'm, I'm, I have to say I'm a little taken aback. So we were supposed to move into this January 1st of 2017. And just yesterday, I got an email that AJC, AJCC has decided that it won't start until January 1st of 2018. I don't really know why UICC in the rest of the world is going to start January 1st, 2017 as planned, and <laughs> we're going to be a year behind. And I don't know, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but I just heard this yesterday. I have no idea what all the uh, thought processes were behind that and, and why that decision was made. So. Uh, we were all kind of gearing up to start doing this, and now I'm not sure what we should do. <laughs> Brief mention of PET. You know, I don't think PET for GGOs has value. False negative rate, very high. False positive rate, very high. Um, I think it really doesn't have value for these uh, GGOs. So summary, I think that a lot of data suggests that solid tumor size is really the key, um, and of course, Maybe that means that pure GGOs, we don't really care about that much. Um, I think we probably do care, but probably only a little bit. And it's probably really a matter of, you know, is this going to progress? And I think that a factor that you would have to weigh, is this a patient that you're going to be able to follow consistently and they're going to be able to be observed or are they going to get lost to follow up? I think you have to keep that in mind. <clears throat> so, let's talk a little bit about observed behavior. If we're going to select patients based on how these lesions change over time, how do we do that? Well, just some background first. I think that uh, CT screening has changed things in a lot of ways. So, if you look at volume doubling time, people that are picked up by routine, they walk into their doctor's office, they have a little bit of cough or, you know, some other symptom, uh, or occasionally they get a chest x-ray because they're going to have their hernia repaired or something like that. Um, you know, we don't see very many patients that have these long doubling times. On the other hand, in the CT screening studies, there's clearly a higher proportion of patients that have long volume doubling times. And so I think that, you know, you have a spectrum of disease found by routine care, and when you start doing CT scans, 
you find a larger spectrum of disease that is a more indolent cohort, um, has a good prognosis. Um, I don't like the term overdiagnosis. I don't find that to be clinically useful at all. Um, but I think that we need to appreciate the fact that there's a spectrum. And I think that, you know, we tend to think of lung cancers like this as, you know, aggressive tumors. But the reality is that there's a whole spectrum and there are some cute little lung cancers that are never going to hurt anybody. And, you know, I think we just have to think about it that way. You know, just like I think we have to think about ground glass lesions as maybe they're not all the same. And, and lung cancers, I think, are a spectrum of disease. And, and we have to think in a more sophisticated way. <coughs> So, you know, this puts it in a graph. So, you know, you can look at lifetime, you can look at tumor burden and think that, you know, when the tumor gets to a certain point, uh, it's going to kill you. And there are certain aggressive cancers that just grow really rapidly. There are some that are less aggressive and you might live for quite a long time before this really gets to a point where it kills you. And there probably are some inconsequential cancers that in the past we didn't really fully appreciate. And I think that when we're talking about these less aggressive cancers, we really need to start factoring in more of the comorbidities. If you have a small cell lung cancer, it doesn't really matter a whole lot what other comorbidities you have. That small cell lung cancer is going to be the thing that ends your life almost all the time. You know, on the other hand, when you have a pretty well-behaved tumor, you really have to start thinking a little bit, you know, is this a patient who's going to live long enough for that to become a problem and a threat to their life or not? So I think that, you know, we have to think about cancer as a spectrum of disease. And if we're trying to make the right decisions for patient, we have to kind of think about the relative balance of the threat of that cancer versus other things. So if we're going to follow things and we're going to see how they change over time, you know, one of the issues is how sure are we of that? So, there, you know, there are a number of studies that have suggested that differences, be, you know, of less than, now this is just diameter, it's not volumetrics, but, you know, less than one and a half to two millimeters, that there's a fair amount of inter and intra observer variability. You know, there's some studies where you do a scan and 15 minutes later you do a second scan and actually amazingly about 20% of patients will have one volume doubling happen in those 15 minutes. Um, so, you know, we got to be a little careful about some of this. Now, depends on a lot of factors, depends on the slice thickness of the scan and, you know, a lot of different factors. But just keep it in mind, if you're talking about small, subtle differences, don't don't overreact to something that you're not completely sure about. So is it safe to observe growth? Well, there are a number of studies. So this is a retrospective study. They looked at pure GGNs. They observed them for at least six months. Uh, their policy was to resect them if they had a certain size or sometimes if the patient was pushing really hard. Um, and, you know, what they found is they, uh, you know, they compared, uh, you know, patients here and uh, the ones that developed a new solid component, the ones that grew or the ones that didn't change but ended up being resected anyway, you know, probably because the, uh, you know, the, uh, the patients were, were pushing hard for it. And the bottom line is if you look at the percent of invasive cancer, the size, the node positivity, whatever, it didn't suggest that waiting for these changes to occur as opposed to, you know, patients saying, I'm tired of it, just get it out. It didn't appear that there was any difference there. And, you know, in terms of being able to cure these patients, you know, there were no recurrences, you know, pretty good follow-up after resection. Another study, so this is part solid. The previous one was pure GGN, so part solid. Um, so they had a uh, follow-up period, uh, an observation, observation period, I think, of, uh, uh, where is it down here? Oh, I don't remember. Well, I guess it's here. This, this is post-operative follow-up. 
Well, I don't remember, but I think the observation period here was several years in median. And so, um, you know, they also had a similar thing, invasive cancer, not really any different, uh, no node positivity uh, of those that, you know, were resected at some point uh, regardless or those that, you know, had some change. And again, with a uh, pretty good follow-up, no difference in outcomes. So this is another study from uh, Japan. So this one suggested maybe something a little bit different. So they uh, looked at patients that were either pure or part solid. Um, they, you know, all grew. Uh, they observed a fairly linear rate of growth. Um, you know, this is sort of what they found. Um, now, in resection outcome, there were 10% that were node positive. So this is one study that makes me say, whoa. You know, maybe maybe that's not so safe. Um, let's see. I try to go back here. Previous, you know. But when I look at this study, you know, so they called it part solid, even if it was ninety percent solid, but had a you know ten percent ground glass component. And I don't know. You know, I'm not so comfortable observing those lesions. I think that's a little bit of a different beast. The other thing is that they were defining solid component on mediastinal window and a seven millimeter slice thickness to the CT. Hmm, I don't know. So this is one study that suggested that uh, you know maybe there might be some nodal involvement, but I have some questions about their inclusion and, and how they did the study. Um, the others don't suggest that. I showed you this slide earlier. Uh, what I didn't show you on this slide is that, you know, of those that were finally resected, they were all stage 1A, essentially all stage 1A. Um, you know, in most of these, at least when these pure GGOs are mostly GGO lesions, uh, most of these were AIS, MIA. Um, so again, this was a study where they followed patients for 10 to 15 years, long-term follow-up, and eventually resected them based on some pretty solid criteria for it and ended up with this sort of an outcome. So to me, that's pretty strong evidence that, you know, it's, it's okay to watch and wait for signs that you need to intervene. So this is another uh, prospective study, which was a multicenter study uh, uh, not too long ago. Um, it had uh, over 1,200 patients, so a large study. Um, so I like this study for a couple of reasons. So it was prospective, a lot of patients, multi-center, uh, you know, well done. So they had pretty good definitions of things. And I think this definition to me is very useful. So they defined lesions as either pure GGOs, as heterogeneous GGOs that they called consolidated on lung window, but no solid portion on mediastinal window, or part solid that meant there was a solid portion on mediastinal window. And they had you know, thin slice CTs, it was very well done. They had central review of the pathology and the radiology, very well done study. And they had pretty clear definition of what they called growth. So they said, you know, less than two millimeters, too much intra-observer intra variability. We're not going to accept that. Um, so well done study, well defined. And so this is what they found. So if you look at the overall size of the lesion, so this is the ground glass component growing uh, over time here. Uh, so in a number of patients that they grew, um, but in a number of patients that didn't grow. Um, and in the pure GGNs, not that many grew. Uh, it was more common in the ones that were either uh, heterogeneous or part solid on mediastinal windows. So they also looked at development of a solid component. Again, that happened in some patients, but in a lot of them it didn't. Uh, for the pure GGNs, it really didn't happen in that many patients. Um, and they looked at growth of a solid component. Uh, and so, you know, that also happened in some patients, but not that many. And again, observed over a fairly long period of time. 
So this is kind of the summary of that study. Uh, so what they found is that about 1% went from pure GGO to a heterogeneous. About 5% went from pure GGO to a part solid component. Um, whereas if you had a heterogeneous uh, lesion to start with, about 20% of those went on to become more solid. Um, so these are the percentages. So again, suggesting that, you know, maybe, maybe it's okay to just kind of wait and watch these patients and see what happens. Um, and their final results were that 7% of the patients got resected, 1% of them had invasive adeno, 98% were stage 1A, there was one that was stage 1B, and no recurrences. So waiting, watching, good definition of intervention, seemed to work out okay. How long do we need to follow lesions? Well, uh, I showed you one study earlier where they suggested follow them for three years. If it hasn't changed in three years, forget about it. I'm not so sure. This was another uh, study that uh, looked at lesions that were stable for three years, but they continued to be followed. Uh, so initial three years, they were stable, but then they continued to be followed. Um, pretty good definitions of things. And this is the lesions that grew. So they're not showing you the ones that didn't grow. There were a good number that didn't grow. Um, but 6.7% of patients grew after the initial three years of being stable. And you can look at the growth rates here. So... Um, they're relatively slow, and the average volume doubling time here was about 3.3 years, so pretty slow growth. And it also suggested that, you know, the growth is pretty linear. It doesn't suggest that it suddenly goes crazy. So this is another study. So they initially followed patients for two years, um, uh, and they were stable. But then they continued to follow them afterwards. So they said, all right, if it hadn't changed in two years, then what happens later? Do we need to continue to follow them? And they found that about 44% of them had slow growth, a volume doubling time that also is pretty long. Um, a little interesting that it was a little shorter in the pure GGOs and longer in the mixed ones. I'm not quite sure about that. Um, and there were only 2% that had a growth rate that was a little bit more rapid. Uh, and that's really these patients right here. So again, once again in this slide, they're only showing you the ones that grew. Um, and most of them grew at kind of a linear slow rate, but there were a few that grew more rapidly. So another study uh, followed patients for a while. Uh, no, excuse me, this is the same study. Um, and what they found when they looked at that is that the change in character from a pure to a part solid or to a, uh, a solid portion was really the thing that kind of predicted uh, uh, growth. It was that change of character. So I think the bottom line is that, you know, we see a spectrum of disease. Um, I think we have to uh, take that into account. Um, I think the data shows that sudden changes in GGNs are really pretty rare and that we can observe them uh, and that a, you know, observing them for a period of time is safe. You're not really losing a chance to cure them. And I'm more impressed that waiting for a solid component on mediastinal windows that is two millimeters or greater is probably probably the best trigger kind of on average in most patients. I mean, again, I think you have to take patient characteristics into account. And, you know, we used to quibble a lot at our tumor boards about, uh, you know, small differences. And we used to argue about, you know, well, I don't know, is it, you know, a tiny little bit bigger and... You know, gee, if I really uh, cone down here, I can, maybe there's a tiny little solid speck appearing on a lung window. And uh, is that, is that, you know, that looks like it's just off the side of the vessel. It's a little bump off the vessel that's a little, you know, we used to argue about stuff like that. I think we were trying to split hairs. I don't think, uh, you know, and when I look at more data, 
I'm more convinced that that kind of splitting hairs, if that's what we're doing, we ought to just get another data point. We ought to get another scan in six months and get another data point and end up being more sure about is it really changing or is it not changing? So where are we? I think, uh, you know, things are kind of starting to clear for me a little bit. I feel like I have a little better handle on things. Um, I think that for GGNs, most of them don't change. Uh, some of them do change. Um, I don't think that we can correlate the imaging with the histology very well. Um, and I think that we really have to think about the histology a little bit differently too. You know, I don't think we can say that an invasive adenocarcinoma in a pure GGO is, oh my God, that's that tiger of lung cancer that we're all, you know, all too familiar with. I don't think it is. You know, I think that that's still kind of on the spectrum of fairly well behaved. And I certainly have changed the way that I talk to patients. You know, I, I, I don't really have too much trouble talking patients off the ledge. You know, I talk to patients and, you know, they say, well, but, you know, I've got this GGL and, you know, what if that's a cancer? And I kind of come out and tell them, I said, well, I think it probably is. You know, if we took it out, I bet you the pathologist would say this is a cancer. But I think this is an inconsequential cancer. I think this is a well-behaved cancer. I don't think that it's something that's going to affect you. Uh, I think that, you know, we, ha we know that we can watch this. And if it shows us signs that it's actually progressing, we have plenty of time to intervene and we're not going to lose anything by watching it. So I come right out and say that. And... I, I find it works very well. I, I, I find that I can talk people off the ledge very easily. I'm, I'm amazed. I mean, I just saw a lady uh, the other day where, you know, everybody was telling me, oh, this lady is so determined to have this out. You aren't going to be able to talk her out of it. And in 10 minutes, I had her happy saying, oh, okay, well, fine. You know, but I think a key is they have to come back for follow-up. They have to be observed closely. Uh, I think you can't just let them go. So again, we have the spectrum of disease. We got really aggressive tumors like a small cell. I think the solid spiculated uh, non-small cell lung cancers that we really tend to think of, you know, are fairly aggressive tumors. And I think when we encounter these GGOs, I think that they're somewhere in this range. And in fact, some of them I think are going to continue to be just GGNs and maybe there are markers that define that and they're probably inconsequential. And others are going to develop these other sorts of uh, markers uh, and you know, probably require some intervention at some point depending on patients and comorbidities. Um, so I think we have to weigh these things. I think that we can observe them. I'm more convinced of a solid component. Um, and I think we have to be a little bit careful about not splitting hairs and having enough data points to be sure about it. And so this is kind of my management policy at this point. But, you know, I have to say this is a moving target. And I definitely have changed a lot over the last 15 years or so. So pure GGN, I'd get a follow-up scan in a year. You know, what would make me intervene New solid area that is pretty definite. Um, growth that is rapid. Now, we don't tend to see this very often, but, you know, I don't really know what to do with this. I'm a little bit uncomfortable with it. Maximum dimension more than three centimeters. I'm starting to feel a little uneasy. I don't, I don't know how to think about that, but I would be a bit more inclined to say, well, maybe we should do something about it. Heterogeneous DGN, so something that shows up on lung windows but doesn't have a solid component on mediastinal windows. I would get a follow-up scan and I would see what happens to it. Uh, if it doesn't really change further, I would be comfortable observing that. Um, but I think a good number of those will go on to change, develop a clear solid component on mediastinal windows or, or grow a fair amount. Uh, and if it has a part solid component, uh, follow up scan, but uh, um, you know, small solid component, I'd be willing to kind of watch that for a while. Uh, 
Um, if it really doesn't change over the course of a year, maybe start to space it out a little bit more. But I think more often in these lesions, you're going to end up finding some growth and end up uh, resecting those. So that's kind of my current thing. And I just sort of point out that I think you have to be careful. You know, if you're comparing a CT with five millimeter slices to a CT with one millimeter slices, all bets are off in terms of really, you know, talking about small changes in size or whatever. Um, so I think you have to be a little bit careful when you're comparing scans to be pretty sure about, you know, changes and, and not be fooled. So I'll stop there and hope we can have some discussion. <clears throat>